The nurse sitting across from me was looking inside the binder confused. She flipped through one page after another, sifting through progress notes and orders, around us with the sound of a dozen other voices speaking at the same time, discussing patients and their care plans, bed movements and medications, physiotherapy and discharge follow-ups. I just met him this morning, she said. I wish I could be of more help, but like I said, he's a John Doe, so we don't know much about him. Ah, here he is. Maybe this will give us something. There was a hastily scrawled progress note from the day of admission that read, Integumentary. Midline abdo laceration. Incision appears to be infected. Wound covered with newspaper on admission per triage. Purulent drainage noted. Arrhythmia. Foul smell. Possibly old pericardial incision, but no sternal or femoral sites found. Will order wound care to assess and follow. That's it? I guess so. It's been really busy lately, though. They probably didn't have a lot of time. There were other notes as well, but nothing concerning the wound. All right, I guess I'll just have to take a look at the thing for myself, I said, standing up. Is he with it? That's hospital code for, is he going to hit me or scream bloody murder when I rip the bandage off? Is he confused or is he with it? She hesitated. No, not with it, I wouldn't say. But then it's hard to really tell. He doesn't say anything and if you do try to look at him in the eye, he just looks right through you. Sounds like he's probably confused. Maybe nonverbal? Yeah. I would have thought so, too. But there's something about him. You know how they say that you can see intelligence in the eyes? Well, when I look him in the eyes, or try to, it's like there's some... She stopped and looked embarrassed. Somewhat. This is going to sound stupid. I should probably just stop talking. There were people all around, but nobody was listening. The other nurses and doctors had their topics on their minds, and they were all engaged in other matters. What, what is it? I asked, curious now. Her face softened, and she opened up and told me. It's like when you look in the eyes, and there's somebody really wise looking back at you. You know, somebody way smarter than me. It's almost like he doesn't want to look at you because he's off somewhere else in his mind. Or like, he doesn't think we're worth his time. Like I said, this is probably sounding really stupid. Not at all. I said back to her, thinking I would have to go and see for myself. You want me to come with you? She asked. It's okay. You're busy. Go ahead and deal with other patients. If you hear me calling for you, just come give me a hand, will you? For sure. She said and quickly ran off to deal with other matters. Call bells were ringing constantly around every corner. and Somebody was coming quickly with a tray of food or a stretcher, a cleaning cart, a medication cup in hand. I made my way through the semi-organized chaos and walked down the hall towards room 14. It was the furthest room for the nursing station, and as I walked past a few others, I heard patients inside calling out, screaming, wailing in pain and terror of invisible enemies. I stopped once or twice and looked in to see nurses were already engaging in helping some of them. Other staff members put on bright yellow isolation gowns and gloves and prepared to enter different rooms. The powerful odor of infection wafted out of room 14 as I approached. I doused myself with hand sanitizer like a priest with holy water at the threshold, and I quickly gowned and gloved, walking into the room and into the thick of it. As I entered room 14, I saw a man lying in bed. He was staring at the ceiling and did not acknowledge me when I said my greetings. Hello, sir. My name's Jerome, and I'm a wound care nurse. I'm here to take a look at your dressing. I hear you've got a bit of a hole in your abdomen there, and uh, the doctors would like me to see what I can do to help. Is that okay with you? He did not say anything. I stepped forward and stood at the side of the bed, pushing the button on the side of the bed rail. I made the whole thing go up, raising it up to waist height. Okay, I'm I'm just going to pull back the sheets and uh, take a look here, okay? Again, he said nothing. I pulled down the bed sheet, pulled up his hospital gown, revealing a hairy chest and abdomen with a patchwork of bandages covering his stomach. Slowly, I began to pull them away one by one. I watched his face closely, ready to back away at any sign of anger or agitation. 
pericordial incision is typically made during a CABG or a coronary artery bypass graft procedure, more commonly known as open heart surgery. But it is one of severe large cuts made during the procedure. The sternum will have a large vertical incision at the midline of the chest. There will also be incisions made in one or both legs depending on the quantity of arteries being harvested for the procedure. Now, this is all important for the simple reason that Mr. John Doe had none of these scars. No wounds from any other surgical incisions, and yet here was this long lateral scar on his abdomen, isolated and alone, no other wounds anywhere. The man appeared malnourished and thin, and he hadn't eaten anything in a very long time. The nurse had said that he was refusing to eat, and the next step was to insert a nasogastric tube later that day. Looking at the wound, I saw it was macerated and red, wet and white in a few places, pruny, like fingers after being in the bath for too long. There was an odor coming from it, a rank and putrescent stink like death and infection. My job could be interesting and rewarding some days, but this was shaping up to be a hell of a morning. Of course, I had no idea. Not yet. The smell only became worse as I began my work. I cleansed the wound with a massive amount of saline and watched as yellow pus seeped out in vast quantities. Once it began to run clear, I dried it with gauze as best I could. The whole time the man just stared at the ceiling, looking like he was far superior to all of us, like none of it was important. I quickly cleansed my hands with hand sanitizer and laid out my sterile field. I set out my fresh sterile gloves and opened my dressing tray and my packed gauze. Also, I took out a swab so I could measure the depth of the hole. After putting on my sterile gloves, I plunged the swab into the wound and began to explore it from multiple angles, trying to determine its size, width, depth, height, and it was all that I needed, and then I could start to pack it. All the while, it seeped and stank. The wound edges seemed to move and twitch as I worked, as if it was a mouth and I was a dentist poking around inside. I mean, but that was silly, I thought to myself. It was just the visor fogging up, distorting my vision, of course. I managed to measure its width and height. I couldn't determine the depth. The whole while, I was observing the patient's face and seeing he didn't flinch or grimace at any of my prodding. I was thankful that he wasn't swinging at me, at least, as some of the others did. Next was the final part of everything. I just had to pack the wound and cover it with dry dressing. Then I could finally get away from the smell of the room. Deciding that it would take far too long with tweezers, I simply used the sterile gloves to pack the hole in the man's abdomen. I lightly began to fill the wound, starting at the outside edges. As my hand went into the center of it, I began to feel something, something pulling hard on my fingers like one of those finger trap toys that I'd played with as a kid. The sensation was so unusual and bizarre, given the circumstance, that I was I was completely shocked. I, I couldn't even open my mouth to scream. I just tried to wrench my hand away desperately. The thing inside the man's abdomen held fast, and then something sharp started to slice on my finger, and that was enough to bring me back to reality. I remembered I could call for help. I let out a howling scream, wailing at the top of my lungs in horror and pain. Looking at the man's face, I saw he was no longer catatonic. He was staring straight at me now, his blue eyes shining with, with satisfied intelligence. He appeared to me suddenly like a man who had not eaten for a very long time, who was finally getting a meal. My screams rang out in the room, but I realized with dawning terror that the other confused patients in the room surrounding this one were also screaming loudly, probably drowning out my calls for help. As my eyes darted around the room for something or anything to help the situation, I felt my hand getting sucked in like a, like a ramen noodle being slurped up by a greedy mouth, sharp teeth digging into the flesh of my fingers at the same time, and then were up to my knuckles, and then my palm. I reached over with my other hand and tried to pull my wrist trying to yank it free. It hurt more than anything I'd ever felt in my life as I pulled against the razor-sharp teeth that were ripping through my flesh. The man's face was smug and self-satisfied, and I felt his stomach mouth pull me in deeper, now ingesting my hand nearly up to the wrist. I pulled my other hand away as it tried to suck that one in too. The whole time I continued to scream and scream, now using my foot as leverage against the bed frame, doing anything I could to get it out and get it away. It felt like fire in my hand, burning me up to my wrist. The pain was so severe, I felt like I would black out, but I managed to stay conscious as I fought and I pulled against the strength of this horrifying alien creature. 
I glanced again at the man's face and saw his tongue looked black inside his mouth, his teeth yellowed and missing in places. He began to laugh, but the sound didn't come from his face. And just as the world began to go red and then black around the edges, I heard the sound from behind me as someone entered the room. My wrist was freed, as if the giant mouth had merely opened up and released it. I fell backwards against the wall, my forearm a bleeding stump that I, I, I held up and I looked at dumbly. The nurses who entered the room said later that they they didn't see the man smiling or, or hear him laughing as they entered. That he looked catatonic as always. What they did see was a hysterical nurse on the floor weeping and screaming and missing a hand. A trail of blood leading to the bedside into a hole in the man's abdomen. A very unusual wound that was now turned up at the edges. Turned up like, like a satisfied smile. Hey there kids, it's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and I want to tell you thank you so much for watching tonight's video or listening to tonight's episode of the podcast. I really appreciate it, and anytime you guys give me a subscribe or a follow or a like or a comment or literally just a watch, I can't thank you enough for it because you're the reason I keep making episodes and you guys are the reason that I love horror as much as I do. We're in the middle of summer, and I'm from Texas, which means that it's a great time for iced tea. And you know who makes iced tea? My wife. My wife sells tea. My wife sells tea on Etsy.com slash shop slash Ivory Monocle Tea. And if you want to get the Mr. Creepy Pasta special, you can order a dark and stormy night and specifically request a dabbing sticker that you only get if you ask for it. And as always, I want to give a very special thanks to all of my patrons at patreon.com slash Mr. Creepy Pasta, because you guys are the reasons I get to keep my lights on in the house and get wonderful little treats for my cats and everything like that. And also the reason why we keep getting special custom series just for the channel. So a special thanks to Jacob Schaefer, Jordan Alexander Sanchez, Brian Arst, Ken Lendo Higuchi, Bobby Carmen, Tristan Pelton, Chase Burnett, Bardo Hawk 764, the Banana Mafia One, Melancholy Corpse, Hollow Zero, Ferb, Harley, Billy Morrow, Katie Birch, Sashi Sasaku, Caden the Spooky Boy, My Body Sounds Like Rice Krispies, Ashwood, Lord of the Weebs, Jay, Faye Lockett, Miss Alexandra, Mr. Unsettling Spaghetti, Eurogore, Suji Campbell, Marco Takes Dabs 420, Stricken, Azarine Fox, Robert White, Andres Garcia, Snails Brennan, Legit Quad Feed, James Bruce, Chris Lovins, Freddy Krueger, Tynan, Justin Johnson, Michael Scarborough, Infernal One, James Lowe, Lisa Cottrell, Caspian, Jordan Nels, Hades Nephew, Tater Chip, Acid System, Prozac and Pancake Appreciation Society, Cryptic Nightmares, Someone You Love, Kira the Sloth, Tommy Green, Sky Harbor, Caleb Dougal, Nina Smith, Nico Kyle, Rafael Rodriguez, The Ginger Bros, Aaron Stormcrow, Daniel Polson, Trace Miles, Corey Kenshin, and Peaceful Buddha. That's right, guys, at patreon.com slash Mr. Creepypasta, you could join this amazing list of people's names I mispronounce and the list of Patreons down there in the description. But of course, none of that is ever required. I just appreciate you guys subscribing and watching and honestly being here. So, to all of you, sweet dreams. <laughs>